Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are strictly the views or opinions of the presenter. Nothing in here is the view of the firms, corporations, financial entities that anybody represents. Uh, nothing expressed here is a view of any um, regulator or semi-regulatory agency. Uh, all content is intended to be educational. Nothing in this episode construes specific investment advice. And if you do require advice, you should seek an appropriate advisor, be that a financial planner or a tax advisor or possibly a lawyer. Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. Uh, this episode is going to be good for a bunch of insurance credits. Uh, so it'll be good for life insurance credits in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. Uh, it'll be good for an accident and sickness credit in Alberta, uh, no life credit in Alberta. Um, that's increasingly the case that things are either life or ANS and not both. And I would just encourage you to go have a look. If you're in BC, I know the BC Insurance Council, sorry, Insurance Council of BC sent out a missive about this, but make sure you're aware of your um, CE rules for British Columbia. Um, there'll be a bunch of old episodes where I said at the beginning, this would be good for an Insurance Council of BC credit, but uh, generally speaking, investment topics are not good in British Columbia anymore. Um, so watch those new rules from the Insurance Council of BC. Okay, um, also it'll be good for uh, financial planning credit from FP Canada um, and uh, no IROC or MFDA credits for this episode, uh, just insurance credits. Okay, I'm gonna have uh, Dave Patriarch on. Uh, Dave's been on before, I think this is his third time on the podcast. Um, and this is actually uh, not necessarily the same, We're, but Dave and I are going to be um, co-releasing a podcast together. So starting in the summer of uh, 2022 here, um, one episode per quarter is gonna be co-branded under uh, Canadian Group Insurance Brokers, and CE Drive, that'll give me somebody on the podcast who knows group benefits better than I do um, to help me discuss uh, group benefits topics with those guests. So I'm excited about that. I, I look forward to um, rolling that out. All right, um, the interview is pretty long here, so I've already rambled too much. The object for today's podcast is this little um, monkey right here. Uh, this monkey, whatever kind of monkey he is, I don't know. Um, but this is one of my granddaughter's favorites. Uh, the little paws stick together. So it's like the bull velcro so you can hang it off of things. Um, yeah. So monkey, that's the object for today. All right, let's uh, roll into it. Thanks, everybody. Hi, I'm here today with Dave Petriarch. Dave uh, is well known, I think, to anybody who follows the podcast or who uh, reads anything I post up on my social media feeds. Um, and of course, Dave, you've been on the podcast before, but can you give us a quick intro? Sure. Um, I'm kind of a couple different people. Uh, I've had Mainstay Insurance Brokerage. Yeah, it's a schizophrenic kind of some days. Uh, Mainstay Insurance Brokerage for over 25 years. I do nothing but employee benefits for small and mid-sized companies uh, based in Ontario, uh, but I've got clients from kind of all over the place, but most of the employees are here. And about 18 years ago, I started CGIB, Canadian Group Insurance Brokers. It had, it's had a couple different names through, um, but to try and help uh, share some education back to the advisory um, network around employee benefits. There just really wasn't much. So I uh, kind of got in around in that. And on top of those two things, I'm also a sailor and kind of sail all over the world. So you'll see that show up in my posts and bios and books and, you know, everything. And uh, yeah, that's kind of who I am in a quick nutshell. Of course, you have uh, selling benefits that came out. Is it last year now or two years ago? Yeah, we pu yeah published it in um, November 2020, 2020. I don't know during COVID because I bought I, it for I, my I, father for a Christmas present. I remember this now. So yeah. Wow. Do you, yeah. Do you not like your father that much? <laughs> he gave that. I don't know, <laughs> but I think that's great. Thank you. He's an old insurance guy. He loves oh. stories, and yeah. uh, your book does a lot of that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's cool. Uh, Cool. Very yeah, cool. Thank you a, for supporting it. <laughs> yeah, it's well worth the read. I bought quite a few copies, gave some away. So yeah, I like it. There you um, go. Remind me next time I'm out and I'll dump a bunch to you to, yeah, to share. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, and uh, your ideal client on the benefits yeah. side, can you yeah. talk us through this? 
Um, majority of my clients are under 50 employees, five zero. Um, I think ideal is kind of somebody who's two to 25 employees, probably Ontario based. And what I'm looking for is uh, partnerships. Uh, I, I don't want somebody who's in it for a year. So I'm looking for somebody who's willing to kind of take my advice, we'll work together, we'll find solutions, and we respect each other. Um, so that matters more than whether it's a really rich plan or not, or, you know, a really high profile company or not. I've got clients up into the 200s. Um, honestly, once we get into the fights between HR and, you know, accounting and finance and, you know, boards, and I just start to get frustrated by it all. So I love to deal with decision makers. Uh, and that doesn't have to be the owner, it might be office managers or, you know, key people and stuff like that. So, yeah. And I think hand in hand with that, a lot of your clients um, would, I think, appreciate education. I think that's a fair way to put that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So my thought is that if you educate your clients and they're as smart as we are on the benefits, then there's, you know, four eyes looking at everything instead of two, which is always better. You're more likely to catch uh, mistakes and, and they feel more uh, or better equipped to administer their plan, reduce their risk and and have everything run smoothly. So uh, we, we, yeah, try and make it make the education fun and interesting and useful and, and everything all at the same time. Yeah, perfect. Um, now, can you talk us through CGIB a little bit? And tons of the guests that I've had on this show have been CGIB members as well. So, And thank you for that. I mean, it's great to get them some um, press, but CGIB members are the best at giving back. Uh, CGIB started, as I said, about 18 years ago. Uh, it was a small breakfast group that evolved um, across the the years, people said, okay, we want to do CE events um, that are more uh, group focused and really interactive. So we started doing some of those. We brought out a Slack channel. And basically what the group is, is bringing benefits advisors together to make people better. Uh, it started with a lot of education and sharing, but it's now become sharing between the members and everything else as well. So we have um, between 250, 300 members. Generally, we kind of go up and down seasonally a bit. And um, they they give a lot. Uh, they help their their competitors. They share to make the industry better and, and doing things like your events, which are listened to mainly by advisors, their competition, they don't hesitate to step up and, and make the industry better, which I'm really proud of. I think that's one of the coolest things about CGIB. Very, um, again, education focused community and so much great sharing I see on the uh, CGIB Slack channel and in the resources that you have. There, yeah, it's, so. it, it's amazing. Um, people reach out all the time and say, hey, where do I find a, a CGIB for investments and retirement or individual life? And I'm like, I don't I think we've ever seen one. And when you try and describe to somebody who's kind of outside of it, they kind of go, wait a minute. So you give away all your best documents and templates and best ideas to your competition. I'm like, yeah, every single day. That's exactly what I do. Yeah. I really am seeing that on the individual side now, uh, although it's a newer organization, but at Financial Planning Association of Canada. So that's my, yep. uh, if you get that question, send them over to FPAC or send them to me. I, I will. Can, I can I will. talk about FPAC happily. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Same type of thing, you know, template sharing and advice on both like technical and uh, practice management questions. So yeah, like none of this stuff is new, right? Like, I mean, it's it, in, insurance is kind of an old product. And I mean, there's different techniques and, and models and stuff. But for the most part, it's been pretty much the same for, you know, hundreds of years. So yeah, yeah. there's no reinventing the wheel, you don't need to. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so now I know something that you and I have chatted a bit about and something that shows up in sort of the community from time to time is when we talk about group benefits, what's the difference between sort of benefits and insurance? Where do you draw that line? Yeah, and it's it's kind of a fuzzy line, I guess. Um, group benefits are basically two parts, insurance and compensation. And the insurance side is pretty straightforward. That's the life insurance, the disability, accidental death, maybe short-term disability, maybe CI catastrophic travel, maybe hospital, and um, those and, and high cost drugs. And then you have the compensation side, which is things like dental, uh, vision, paramedics, like chiropractors, massage, physio, uh, the day to day drugs, not high cost. Um, did I say dental? Probably. Um, those type of things. And they really evolved not as insurance, but as compensation. Back in the late uh, 70s, when we had wage and price controls, um, a lot of listeners may not remember those days, um, but basically uh, the government and large companies were prohibited from giving raises. 
and uh, and it started with the federal government, trickled down to some of the large companies, and then uh, and ran for two or three years and stopped. And so what the unions negotiated was bigger benefits um, when they couldn't get pay. And so enrolled dental and vision, and those became kind of a part of our day to day life, which never really went away. So yeah, it's that's kind of the the split. I mean, obviously it can it can blur a little bit depending on the client. If you're small in a company, your traditional insured plan, then more of it is kind of insurance, but it's a lot of things like dental are just budgeting. We don't know anyone who's ever lost a home due to dental bills. Yeah, that's, it's a great point. And you know, I think like the worst it can get here is say kids ortho. And if, you, know, you see a lot of plans today, they don't even cover kids ortho, right? So. Yeah, yeah, very few, yeah. Yeah. Um, so then when an employer is paying premiums for the group benefits plan, what do you think they're paying for? Yeah, so it's kind of a split. You're paying, you know, for the the pooled benefits like the life and disability. You're it's pure risk. It's pure insurance. Um, you know, you may never have a claim. In fact, you hope you never have a claim. And what I often will say to people that are newer, like potential clients or new advisors, is you got to think insurance is something you want to pay into forever and never claim against. Because if you're claiming you've got a loss, and in most cases, if it's real insurance, true insurance, a loss is bad. It's a loss of life. It's a loss of ability, disability. It's your house burned down. It's your car crashed. Um, the other stuff that you're paying is the compensation or budgeting part of it. And you don't, you know, it's, it's not bad to have a dental claim. It's not bad to have a visual claim. They're usual. They're repeatable. They're non-catastrophic and everything. So I, I think employers have got to kind of think of it two ways. You can't say, well, I paid $25,000 in and we only got $15,000 back. No, you pay $25,000 in of which 10,000 went towards, you know, insurance, which you hope you'll never use. And 15,000 went to pay claims, which you fully used, you know, and now your rates are going to go up next year or whatever. <laughs> um, so I, I think people kind of need to uh, kind of get the differentiation between what is, um, you know, we used to say in in individual life, you know, you had term life where you were renting it and whole life where you were buying it. And, uh, and in group insurance, we have that division too, not quite the same, but uh, you know, there's the insurance risk that you're buying and, and covering, and then there's a compensation side on the other way. And it still is a great form of tax effective compensation, except for Quebec, um, where it's all tax-free benefits. And there aren't very many of those left for employers to give to employees. Yeah. So, and this is a good point that really health and dental doesn't really work. Like it's not a great benefit to offer if not for the tax advantages. Yeah. Cause when you look at administrative costs between our commissions, the insurance company's administration, profit, premium taxes. Um, if you set a typical small company you might have a 75% loss ratio, 25% expense ratio, that would be a really crappy you know, work around just to protect privacy and outsource administration. But when you turn that into tax-free money, it's fantastic. Yeah. So I think that framework is kind of what sets you up for what comes next. And this is where not, I guess, terribly new now, almost uh, what it be, six or seven months since launch here. But I know that working with uh, Benefits by Design, you, like CGIB came up with this catastrophic health insurance plan that Chip now yeah. we'll call it. And sure. It's a little confusing because Chip is uh, for the individual I, folks that'll be the the reverse mortgage product. But yeah, um, I know I, so, I get reminded of that often. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, sorry for bringing it up. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so I I know there's uh, and you already gave a history lesson on uh, benefits in general, um, but yeah. you sort of um, I, I think attribute some of this history to BBD's old uh, Ben account plan. Hundred percent. Yeah. So. It, it actually go if I can go further back than yeah. that. Um, about 22 years ago, um, I was dealing with Can Life at the time before they became Great West and then Can Life again, uh, and they had a health spending account and it was relatively new to the smaller markets. It had been around for a while to the larger market, but um, I thought this was the coolest thing in the world. So I reached out and said, "Hey, let's let's." do lots of health spending account stuff. You don't make a lot of money on it, but it's low maintenance and really flexible and cost control, all these great things. 
But the problem is we need the catastrophic coverage. And so Canalife at the time could do a thousand dollar deductible and nobody else in the industry really could very well. Uh, Clerica did soon after, which was actually mutual at the time, became Clerica, became um, Sun Life along that path. Um, so they had these products. And so we helped the insurance company do the marketing for them, pieces and everything. And it worked really, really well. And so then when the mergers happened and Canada Life became Great West and Clerica became Sun, both companies dropped the product instantly. And it was labor intensive. Uh, it was a little bit hard to understand and communicate, um, but it was kind of ahead of its time. So they they dumped it and almost immediately, like within a week, uh, within a year or so, uh, BBD launched Ben Account. And it was kind of a, a soft launch at the beginning and then kind of took off. And once I found it, I'm like, okay, great. I can put my clients back to that kind of plan design. And it's that hybrid of health spending account with catastrophic health coverage above it. And, uh, and it, it just worked. And so there's kind of a history now of over 20 years. Um, and for 20, I guess, pretty much almost maybe 18 or 19, I've been dealing with BBD with Ben account cases. And, uh, and they've been running incredibly well, uh, very cost controlling and stuff. So just so I'm perfectly clear yep. here. So the thousand dollars, like you put a thousand dollar HSA in place or whatever amount you want. Yep. So I would and, say most of my plans are 1500, 2000, yeah, it's a little bit higher than that, but yep. And then your prescription drugs would have that thousand dollar deductible. Correct. So the catastrophic or, coverage yeah, has a thousand dollar deductible, no limit on the drugs, hundred percent coverage. Yep. Um, so that covers uh, drugs, uh, travel from the first dollar, um, hospital, some major medical and travel, uh, and travel hospital drugs, major medical, those things. Yeah. So you, you pay the first thousand dollars, which can be paid from the health spending account, or you can coordinate with spousal plans. There's a lot of moving parts, depending on how, what your situation is in your family. And, um, yeah, so it, it kind of splits out that, uh, that risk and, um, it, it, it gives you the coverage for the big, bad, ugly and the flexibility of the health spending account for the day to day, which we talked about. Yeah. Ben account is still available. You still it is. run it. Yeah. 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 Ben accounts available to the public. Uh, any advisor, licensed advisor can sell it pretty much any province. Uh, the difference with this one, if I can go into that, is it is transparent and fully pooled. So one of the faults I've always had with it, and I've been very vocal, which is why the product <laughs> happened as it did, was um, when you did have claims over a thousand dollars, not necessarily over 10,000, the standard stop loss uh, part uh, point, but when they were over a thousand, you'd have these weird adjustments in rates because you had a very low, low premium. All of a sudden you hit this high cost claim, like $5,000, which isn't really high cost anymore. And your rates would you know, double on the catastrophic portion. Right. Now it was low already. So it wasn't really, even if the rates doubled, it wasn't expensive, but it, it was hard to explain why you're getting like, you know, 50 or 75% increases on a $20 benefit, you know, but and, you were really going from like zero utilization to 500% utilization. Exactly right. Yeah. So I kept pushing back saying, Hey, can't we just fully pool that, you know, like you can reinsure and do whatever you want behind the scenes above, but let's get the, that, that thousand dollar to say $10,000 part fully pooled. So and yeah. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Yeah. No, and, and the answer was always, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that someday. And, and they just, they listen very politely and like most people do to things I say, but then they reached out again and said, Hey, do you, do you really want to do this? And you know, like, let's make it happen. So um, really with Ben account, if you hit that, just for the sake of argument, $5,000, yep. you're, you're not pooled on that risk. You're, you're all essentially experience rated on well, that risk or kind of. It wasn't of quite. Yeah, it was okay. kind of. Yeah. So okay. it was not like hundred percent experience rated, but because you said, like you said, from going from no claims to lots of claims, it would have this you know, effect. And it's waited over a couple of years and, and they, they're not trying to, you know, get every dollar back ever, you know, right away. But I mean, it kind of has that, the, the same problems most traditional plans have for small groups of, you know, like a, on a traditional plan, a $10,000 stop loss does very little to help uh, an employer because the first 10,000 of experience is going to hit them. Well, this isn't quite that bad, but it still is kind of in, ineffective in what it could be, I guess. Still running that risk. Yeah. So who was your, you said you had some Ben account clients and yeah. who was your sort of ideal Ben account client? Where would you put uh, that? Yeah, that's a great question. There isn't one. Um, okay. It, I mean, so it's, it's interesting because they've kind of been all different sizes. I've had interest from, 
you know, three person groups to hundreds of lives. It, it, you know, tech and younger people kind of get it a little bit better because they're kind of used to the, the flexi idea. And I, I don't know why that is, but most of the groups I've had on it for close to 20 years are not young groups and they're not tech groups. I mean, they're everything from, you know, retail and manufacturing, you know, all sorts of different things. Um, I've got, bakeries and I've got donut chains, you know, that, that are on it. Uh, so the, I don't know if there's a typical client by industry or by size for that matter. I will say that there's one thing they all kind of are attracted to, and that is cost control for the employer, because the employer basically is setting inflation in, in many areas of the, of the plan um, and flexibility for the employees. So it's kind of a win-win. And is it, do you see rates come up and down under that plan? Yeah, so you kind of have to disassemble a little bit to look at it. Uh, generally, the average rate increases if we go if we're going to kind of make a pretend rate mm -hmm. of of the insurance, the catastrophic, and the health spending account spending, what's actually used, they they probably follow along a typical inflationary rate of healthcare in Canada, with combined with aging and stuff is probably around three or four percent. So um, it's kind of trending along the same line. It's just where's your line? So if you put in a thousand dollar health spending account, you're going to have a lot more cost control than somebody puts in 2000 or 3000, but we're not getting away from inflation. I mean, every year, you know, drugs are adjusted, massage, physio, dental fee guide adjustments and stuff like that. So um, those, these costs are still there, but the top end is maxed out and uh, by the, the health spending account. Yeah. And I think this is something that I've seen you sort of push for um, is this idea that everybody's going to have roughly the same, and I'm going to use the word inflation, but yep. whatever word we want to use on their benefits plan over the long haul. Yes. Right? Like there's, so, you know, sometimes it feels like, I don't know, the insurers are out to get you, Yeah. but you know, it really, I think when you look at most, you, I know you've released this yep. number, you show on my block, I, here's the sort of inflation factor over and here's why yeah. it is right i think yeah and it's i i think the biggest problem we have and why people are so doubtful of insurers I, is a lack of transparency so, so you know we, we do get good claims data on traditional plans and everything but things like um stop loss we don't know what goes into that pool we don't know what's paid in we don't know where the rates come from or or anything to kind of help uh, so I think when you can kind of see the numbers and everything else, it starts to make sense. So I, I'd mentioned, and I, I share on my website, my average increases over the past uh, 15 or 20 years, and it, it averages out always around three to 4% a year. Like there's big ones and the last couple of years have been flat or decreases. Uh, but the interesting part is most advisors don't track their numbers. So they may complain about insurance companies and, and kind of where the rates are and how they're calculated, but they don't have any of their own data to, to refute it. So when I kind of pull my numbers and go, okay, you know what? My average is three and these clients are average and everything else. I'm kind of looking at it going, the increases are not unreasonable. What is, is their variation in rates. So I always say we don't have a high cost drug problem. We have a lack of insurance problem. We don't have a rate volatility problem. We have a lack of insurance problem. Uh, we, we don't have a good mechanism to spread the risk. And um, when you look at my three or 4%, people will jump and say, wait, that's way higher than inflation. And you go, well, hold on. Inflation is a basket of goods and we're just one part of it. And quite frankly, it's kind of funny because we're lumped in with personal care and shampoo and, and yes. things like that with healthcare and, and personal care. Uh, but what we have to realize is traditional plans and, and hybrid plans like CHIP as well, if we have life and disability insurance and so on, then those benefits are all demographically shifting as well. So if you just kept the same, you know, five or 10 life small business and everybody got a year older every year, then your life rates are going up seven or 8% a year. Your disability rates are going up seven or 8% a year. So when you kind of unbalance and take out the, uh, the, um, the aging effect, then what you find really quickly is healthcare spending, and by healthcare, I'm saying like health and dental and, and all that stuff, is actually just around inflation, like 1.7 or old inflation numbers, not this month, <laughs> but, but, like, yeah. but 1.7, you know, 1.8, 1 1.6, yeah. 2%. And so it's really not that bad. Again, the problem is volatility. So part of the reason for this product was let's get rid of that volatility. Let's give predictability to small and mid-sized business to allow them to take control of it, understand it, see it, 
and have kind of that reasonable rate. And most of my clients, if I went out and sold solely on the fact of, we're just going to give you a 3% or 4% rate increase every year, regardless of what your claims are, most people would jump on it and go, yeah, that's great. Like that would, that would be fantastic because there's nothing quite like that. And I think going back to the, uh, you know, insurers kind of getting rid of their um, health spending account products. And I think Steve McEwen and, and Tim Kane over at my HSA talk about this. A lot of it was really just systems. Like they just didn't have systems to do it. They didn't yeah. necessarily want to maintain the technology to do it. So yeah, there's two or three parts and they've talked about them, but it's everything from a lack of technology, being able to do the double adjudication. So you adjudicate to the deductible first and the health spending account second. That's one problem with a lot of companies. The rollover of a health spending account on used funds is an issue. We still have one major insurer who does an embargo for the first 60 or 90 days of every new year where you can't put in claims online because they have to sweep up the old claims before you're allowed to put in this year's. And companies like my HSA saw that before they even launched their product and went, okay, we can program around this, but some of the larger legacy based technology systems can't handle that. Yeah. So it's yeah. a challenge. So now uh, we've kind of touched on what's happening with chip here, but can you just give me the breakdown then? What did you take that was working well in Ben account and what, and adjust then to, to create chip? Yeah. Yep, there's two parts to it. Um, one part is we made it uh, fully pooled. So there's two sets of rates, Pharmacare provinces and non-Pharmacare provinces. Everybody has the same rate. So that's where we started. So we, we took a look at the experience. We took CGIB members that already sold it, put it all together and said, okay, let, let's come up with some numbers. So the first part is a stable uniform price. And then the second part is transparency. So every year we're gonna renew that block and we're going to share that experience with all the members, um, be it um, CGIB members, the advisors that sell it, and their clients. So you will not get claims experience broken down by um, company, like you don't get your claims experience, other than the health spending account. Obviously, you get full breakdown of that. But the catastrophic part is just fully pooled, but we're going to share that whole pools experience with everybody. So that's, that's one of the kind of big differences, that transparency. And that, that pooling, that's all that's different. Technically, they're both the same product. And the BBD Ben account is still available in the market for anybody that's not a CGIB member. And deductible then is the same for every group, every plan it sponsor? Is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a thousand single up to maximum of 2000 for a family. Oh, interesting. Okay. And yeah. so you, so it's a thousand single, 2000 family. Can you just talk, sorry, because this family yeah. and um, single deductible thing is, Terribly confusing. It's poorly done in the LQP. Um, so can you just yeah. give me an example of how that would work? So um, so if somebody's family coverage and it's January 1 yeah. and he goes out and spends $2,000 on drugs in the first uh, month, just make it all kind of extreme and simple, yeah. um, then he would probably use uh, $1,000 out of his health spending account to fulfill the deductible. And the next $1,000 would be covered by his... Um, the the chip plan the catastrophic now yeah. uh, i'm oversimplifying because i'm going to assume his spouse doesn't have coverage elsewhere yes so then she would come along and okay she now has a two thousand uh, dollar drug in the first month mm -hmm. so if their health spending account was two thousand dollars she would then use per thousand the rest would be covered a hundred percent and they'd have their you know full coverage and 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 away you go it's just anything else after that is all pure insurance it's paid it's not coming out of their pocket or or anything like that if you had a third and fourth claim from your children then your the deductibles have been met and you're done real so life that's all going to go pooled happen. onto the plan then correct correct yeah, yeah. and, and, and real every, life it doesn't oh, happen very often no yeah i mean no. you don't find both husbands and wives have high cost uh claims yeah that that's fair um <laughs> now the um the drug formulary, same for everybody then? You're not picking and choosing a formulary? Correct. Today, we aren't. Uh, it's a mandatory generic standard uh, green shield who does a, the, the processing behind BBD um, yeah. formulary. So, you know, good checks and balances, prior authorizations, all the stuff people are used to seeing, but no limit, no nothing unusual. Uh, down the road, I do have on my wish list that we will at some point do an exclusionary formulary to take off the high cost drugs and redirect them to the provincial uh, plans if we don't have pharmacare in place by then. 
but but that'll be maybe a year or two down the road at least. Yeah, that, that was going to be my question here. So what happens as of today if you're in a non-pharmacare province yep. and you do get the you know Solaris claim or or that just hits the entire group, like the yeah. entire the entire group of plant yeah. sponsors? Yeah, it would. Um, and it would be ongoing. Um, now, Solaris is kind of an unusual one because there's, I think, what, 16 people in Canada or 30 yeah. people in Canada on it. So it's it's a $565,000 a year ticket, but it's a very small, small population. So, um, but, but yeah, I mean, if you are, if it's an existing claim, then you're not going to get it underwritten. If you, if you walk in and you're running 250,000% loss ratio because of high cost claim, then BBD is going to turn down the, the quote request. I mean, that's just, yeah. that's shooting yourself in the head, not even the foot. Right. That makes um, sense, yeah. yeah. So, but if it's, if it's, if it occurs, like, once the plan's in place, then then it's fully pooled. You're not going to get a rate increase uh, for it, that the whole pool isn't. So because of drugs like Solaris, and that you pick a good one, those type of things we really need to push off because that is at you know whatever over half a million dollars a year for life. Like this isn't a one and done. This is a for life. That's that's a huge expense that no employer should be forced to pay. And, and I think this ties into why you sort of limited this offering to CGIB members, right? Because there, there's this expectation of sort of field underwriting and kind of plan management from the, the advisor. There is. Um, and it was it was interesting because BBD kind of brought it up as a suggestion to me and said, like, we don't want to just open this up because we don't want it to be a dumping ground for yeah. bad cases. And a lot of plans have faced that. Uh, the Chamber Plan is a fantastic plan. Um, I have a great history with it. I refer people to it all the time. They work on a semi-pooled kind of approach, but it does kind of become a bit of a dumping ground. So they've had to become very restrictive in their drug formularies and, and things like that, which I'm, I'm hoping we don't have to quite get that way. And uh, sorry, it's, it's not, I'm not putting down the chamber plan. I'm just hoping we can maybe improve upon it, the model a little bit better. And, uh, and time will tell you know, how sustainable it is. The other part is um, insurance companies and TPAs ref or really don't want to cut off advisors and you know walk away from business. So I think in a way they kind of made me the bad guy uh, by saying you have to be a CGIB member. So um, I'm not going to. One of the the rules that I put in place or that we agreed to was if you're a CGIB member and you're selling the Ben account case and you don't renew your membership, you don't want to be a member any further. I don't know why that would ever happen, but you know, it could, um, then you can still keep your clients with BBD and you can keep them with the Ben account plan. You just go to a fully experienced rated plan. So you don't have the protection of the pool anymore. Um, and that could be shocking depending on how big your numbers are. Uh, so we, we kind of made sure that employers would be kept whole employees, uh, sorry, advisors are going to lose a little bit in the, the transition, I think. Um, and if, if, I hope it doesn't happen, but if people kind of started playing games with the pool. So if you said, well, we didn't really know that they had that, you know, Remicade claim at $35,000 a year, and they did it a couple of times, like the first time, yeah, you maybe didn't ask the question. We'll have a conversation. Again, get into field underwriting, finding out more about what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing. Uh, and if you consistently mess up the pool, um, then we'll ask you to leave CGIB. And I, I hope I never have to do that. The analogy we use, and it's kind of dirty, but we kind of say, we're okay with you peeing in the pool. Having a high cost claim when you're in the pool and everything else, that's okay. The pee is not going to ruin it for everybody. We got chlorine in the pool. When you bring in garbage, you're taking a dump in the pool. I'm just not going to say it worse yeah, than yeah, that, I guess. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, and it really does affect everybody's enjoyment. So uh, I'm kind of thinking Caddyshack right now and Bill I, Murray. I know. But yeah, yes, yeah, I yeah. But um, so we, you know, we we want this to be healthy. We want it to survive because, in my mind, this is just a pilot project, one of many I've done. Some I win, some I lose. Hopefully, this one will be successful. But I really want insurers to kind of take a look at this if we're successful and say, hey, we can do this too. We can do a fully pooled small group product. It's been tried, but there's, and MetaV Blue Cross is trying right now. Cooperators has tried, Walwinis has tried, but it hasn't been very successful. And it's usually um, a lack of commitment and there's, they don't, no one wants to be a bad guy. I, I love being a bad guy. So it works. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now actually implementing CHIP, you're going to put this in place and 
as I understand it, then chip is going to cover sort of all the kind of borderline predictable stuff, right? Dental, extended healthcare. So, no. So chip okay. is the catastrophic. Oh, sorry, the other way around. I apologize. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah, the HSA is the predictable yeah, and the chip is the I mean. catastrophic. Yeah. 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 So, sorry, yes. So you're going to cover, you're going to use the HSA to cover your dental, your vision care, your Paramedicals, prescription products. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And right. so then what's going to be insured? That's yeah. So now that's up to you, the advisor and the employer as to what you want to offer. So using CHIP, you got the catastrophic healthcare portion covered, but you will likely want to add, you know, life uh, AD and D long-term disability, maybe short-term disability if it's appropriate, maybe crit group CI critical illness if it's appropriate. So you can add all those things. Um, and then of course, things like uh, EAP and virtual telemedicine and all that kind of stuff you can add on as well. So you can, you can kind of build it out to be what you want it to be. You can buy it standalone. Uh, you can mix and match it with like my HSA you could do the HSA and these guys could do the catastrophic. It's not ideal because then you have double administration and, and things like that. So I try and keep it all together. Uh, but you can build it out to make it look like a traditional plan. So I just quoted one the other day and it has uh, one times earnings life insurance, two thirds graded scale LTD coverage, um, uh, the chip catastrophic health coverage and a $2,500 health spending account. So it'll come out to be kind of like a pretty affordable traditional plan in look but a lot more flexibility within it. What conversation do you have with the employer, or the plan sponsor in that case about that $2,500? Like, cause you know, yeah. you don't, you don't get in a situation where five years later, it's still a $2,500 HSA, right? Uh, you might, you might. And so a lot of companies, yeah, it has stayed the same amount. So uh, when we start out, there's kind of two different kinds of conversations and it really depends on the client. If it's a virgin case, so there's no existing coverage, then you're kind of just saying, what's your budget? How much do you want to spend? Um, but if you're doing a traditional plan and you're trying to displace it to this, what you'll often do is figure out the cost per employee and then build it backwards. So you'll say, okay, it's your benefit plan costs $4,500 a year per employee. So let's give $3,000 in a health spending account. We'll use $1,500 for, you know, the pooled lines and, and you know, away you go. So it, um, it really depends on which way you're going to do it. So then what we do throughout the year, as you kind of continue along and you get to your first renewal, we show what the utilization is of the health spending account. We show how many people have hit the limit. And then we have a conversation. We say, is this okay still? So what you're going to find is if the average spend was say a thousand dollars last year and you had a $2,000 health spending account, it might be $1,100 this year and you know, 1050 next year and 1300 the next. It's going to bounce up and down. But as long as the majority of people aren't hitting the limit, that's the inflation and utilization and trends that we're seeing inside that. Um, then when we when we start to hit too many people hitting the top end, so they're hitting the max of the health spending account, we go back and ask the question. And some employers say, no, nope, let's just leave it. That's our budget. That's what we're offering. And others will say, let's bump it. So we've got clients that started at 1,000, went to 1,500, 2,000, 2,500. During COVID, I've got one company that's uh, in the trade show business. So they've done massive layoffs, cuts, and everything else because their business has basically been dead. So they reduced all their health spending accounts, but cut all the catastrophic coverage uh, for the few staff that are still on. So that allowed them to pretty quickly um, adapt to the, um, the, the COVID world, as it were. And that you could also wait and see what the renewal is going to look like on the um, catastrophic stuff and then bunch of the HSA backwards from there, right? Yeah. And we tend yeah. to do HSAs on calendar years just because of taxation stuff and everything. Um, yeah. So quite often the renewal isn't really the, the time where we'd make the adjustment. So we might be doing the renewal in June and the client might say, you know what, you know, like when we, let's for Christmas this year, we're going to give everybody a bit of a bump on the health spending account. And the great thing for people that don't know, and the big plus of health spending accounts over traditional plans is if it's not used, it's not paid for in most cases. So if the employees don't spend it, then it stays in the employer's pocket versus traditional insurance where it all goes to the insurance company and they would adjust pricing for the next year. But this way it's, you know, you don't use it, you don't lose it for, yeah, for, mean, the, uh, for the employer. Yeah, barring some of the more complicated like trust arrangements or whatever, where it can get a little bit murkier around oh, that. Oh, right? 100%. You can have pre-funded things. You can have pay-as-you-go. You can do monthly, quarterly, semi-annual installment. Yeah, like there's all sorts of 
yeah. ways you can I, I complicate this. I prefer the keep it simple, stupid one and just pay for I, what I, you use. I do but... too. I'll give you the best example. I almost all of my plans have no rollover of unused funds. Yeah. And my attitude is vision doesn't really roll over. Paramed's don't roll over. Dental doesn't roll over. Why do we have health spending accounts creating a future unfunded liability for the client? Yeah. Why not just keep it simple and say, if you haven't used it by the end of the year, it's the employers. Not everybody agrees with that. I have one or two clients that kind of overruled me, but uh, I think just to keep it fair, equitable, and uh, quite frankly, I think it looks bad when we're financially compensating people differently based on marital status and things like that. So if you can kind of keep it the same to everybody too, that's that's a bit of a plus. I mean, plenty of other benefits work that way. And I don't just mean like benefits in the benefits plan. I mean, there's like days off, right? You don't yeah. use your days. Some companies now, I know that's become yeah. a trend i'm sure you, your wife you, would be would have a lot to say about this <laughs> yeah yeah they uh they extended their vacation year to try and get more people to use up their vacation allowed a bit more carryover and things like that i i think yeah there's um there's a few there's a few things that we are constantly evolving trying to kind of do better and adapting to our environment too and um, so what are you seeing then in terms of the decision around let's say short-term disability here do you find like do you just go out and kind of you know shop the market or do you have a preferred set of carriers for your you know yeah for those catastrophic risks yeah that's a good question so um i don't so first of all i don't sell based on price and i mean that said we all you have to be reasonable you can't just be the most expensive in the market or anything but um but my my thing my thing i speak to prospect uh, prospective clients about is i want fair pricing and reasonable pricing over time. Like we know it's gonna go up every year. I just don't wanna see these huge swings up and down all over the place. Um, so let's, let's price it right and, you know, let, let try and kind of maintain things over time. Um, I just totally lost the question, sorry. Um, so that's the pricing discussion and then oh. sort of how are you picking the, the catastrophic, yeah. like, or sorry, the, uh, the, the um... The pool risks, the life. Yeah, so it really LTD. depends on where where the client's coming from. Are they trying to compare to a traditional plan? Are they trying to um, compare to like the union plan and they're non-union or something like that? So I'll have some clients that will say, okay, I know what I want. I want one times earnings life. I want, you know, LTD. And then I've got other ones that say, I, I don't even want life insurance. So if we have to take it, let's just make it a minimum 25,000. Um, when you get to the funding of the health spending account, uh, if it's a new company, I will... Uh, say, start with a small amount and increase over time. Don't do something big that you can't afford and you have to come back on. And um, so it, it really runs a gambit. There's no right answer because every business is different and their employee base is different. Uh, I had one recently that we were talking to. They're just a prospect. They may not become a client, but majority of their um, staff, their spouses all have benefits. So they see it as a much more or a much less beneficial benefit, that's right, I, yeah, uh, I, than if people didn't. So yeah. they have a bunch of uh, other guys, it's mainly male dominated, I think 95%. And they have a bunch of wives that are teachers and nurses and, and different, you know, traditional uh, jobs that have good benefits, or reasonable benefits, at least. So they're kind of going, okay, we don't have to do a big health spending account. But we do want to give them life and disability insurance, because they're not covered by that. And that catastrophic may be good if the other plan has a drug cap. So these work well together. So they can put in a really nice, very affordable plan to coordinate with spousal plans. So again, every client is different, need is different, employee makeup is different. So yeah, it's, I, I wish you could pigeonhole everybody. And if you could, you, I wouldn't exist. You just go online and everybody would buy the same plan. But, um, and, and the chip plan is not made for everybody. I mean, lots of people still want the traditional plan, uh, but I have union groups that have it and the union loved it. They're like, wow, employees get flexibility and, you know, we can, you know, spend it however we want to spend it. Fantastic. That's better than the management controlling what we're allowed to spend it on. Yeah. Nope. CRA is the only one that controls it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so the, you said not for everybody, what other factors would cause a, a group not to choose this? Yeah. So um, number one, I guess one that's come up most often is if you do have high claims, if you do have a, a terrible loss ratio, you've got those repeating 
high cost drug claims, for example, I would say, no, we, this is not for you. There are some great products out there that have exclusionary formularies. I think that's a much better decision than putting drug caps on, but that's another one. So you, you can't, there are solutions now that we didn't have 10 years ago uh, to handle those cases. So they, they'd probably be better off somewhere else. Um, if you have a very small group, you know, one or two people, you know, then you're not going to be here. Um, you may, it is a bit of a communication thing and a bit of a learning curve. So if you don't really have anybody who's going to handle the administration, which is very seldom the case or help to communicate, that can be a problem. Language can be a problem sometimes because of that education. So if you've got a workforce that's very diverse, uh, that can be an issue, but I don't find that it has been in any of our groups really. And we can do everything in English and French, of course. Um, and the only other thing is, I would say, if people are trying to really hard, hard, fastly benchmark to something else, so like I've got a few groups that are non-union, and they're saying like we have to match the union plan. I go, well, here's something that works better, and they're like, no, they look at their plan and ours, and if ours doesn't match theirs or better, then we don't do it. So you know, there's there's those type of things, but I I, I don't think there's a real big criteria for who should or shouldn't. I think it's really case by case. It's interesting because there are some benchmarks. I know this is a question that I see in the like CGIB forum sometimes yep. where people want those benchmarks. And I think it's Toronto Board of Trade maintains a pretty good benchmark I don't know study. if they still are. I actually have oh, a message into them. I think yeah. they might have stopped it in 2019. Oh, okay. So yeah. I don't know if it was just a COVID pause or, but I can't find any reference to it at all anymore on their okay. websites. Uh, and yeah. all the links are dead and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the carriers still has a benchmark that's available to Sun Life itself and that Great West Canada Life both do ha have kind of, I can't remember what it's called, Introspector but, or something. Yeah. Uh, and um, and they, they are good tools. Uh, but my problem with benchmarking, and I, I actually fundamentally have a problem with it is um, it shows you where people are, not where they want to be. And it's information um, content with no context. Yeah. So I, I did the benchmarking uh, with Sun several years back uh, with a prospective client. And, and I'm going to oversimplify it, but like half the businesses surveyed had drugs at 100% and half at 80%. So <laughs> their, their take on that was, oh, well, we want to be a better benefit provider. We want to be at 100. I'm like, no, you don't. All the people at 100 want to get to 80. All the people at 80 are not trying to get to 100. Nobody wants to get to 100 for right. cost reasons and fraud reasons, everything else. So I said, so you kind of got to take this with a grain of salt. So you can be an excellent, you know, fourth quarter compens fourth, fourth quarter, yeah, fourth quartile employer in compensation. So your benef benefits are good at 80% and your pay is good, you know, and every, or better than good. You don't have to be that 100%. And, and I think without that context, people tend to view benchmarking poorly and they get stuck in positions you can't get out of. I've got clients that have 100% coverage. I tried to talk them out of it. 10 years later, they can't afford the plan. Every year it's a nightmare, but they don't want to cut it because the employees are so used to it that they don't want to backlash. And they're in a very competitive employment market like everybody is now, but, but they have been for years. So yeah, it's yeah, like Challenges. the average is not the result, right? The average is just the average. Exactly, exactly. So you, uh, I, I think quite often asking the right questions, going back to field underwriting of what are you trying to accomplish? Kind of what's your budget that you want to spend? Because there's no point in creating something that's so expensive, you can't afford it and you're going to have to claw it back. And um, I have um, a phrase of, a guy taught me 30 years ago, uh, one awe, one awe crap wipes out 10 attaboys. So, you know, if you improve your plan 10 times and then take away once, that's all anyone remembers. Uh, if you, you know, doing performance approve, uh, performance um, uh, uh, reviews, your, yeah. reviews, thank you. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure that you don't remember just the bad things. You want to remember the good things. And, and so my goal with clients is I don't want you starting a plan here. Yes, I make more commission. Yes, your employees will be happier, but I would much rather you kind of slowly grow over time. And, uh, and everybody kind of goes, okay, that's fine. But make a note at renewal, we're going to put it right up. And I'm like, no problem. So every year, you know, you, it happens. We put in a new case. First year renewals are always high because people have, haven't had benefits. Claims are high with traditional, any kind of plan. And then the, at renewal, you go, okay, well, your rates are going up 15, 20%. Do you still want to go from 80 to hundred percent? Whoa, whoa, no, no, no. Let's just, let's just stop there. So uh, I, I think you said it kind of 
negatively earlier saying, you know, you don't want to have a health spending account in the same five years down the road. A lot of employers are kind of okay with that. No different than the $1,000, $1,500 or $2,000 dental maximum has been the same for 20 years. Yeah. Just comparatively speaking. So, yeah. So, yeah. Fair point. Um, so then what about the going back to life insurance here? Yep. Do you have plans that have no life insurance benefit at all? Is such a thing possible? Yes. Yeah, you yeah. can. So uh, you brought up my HSA um, earlier. So they have a health spending account. So you could just do just a health spending account, nothing yeah. more. You could add catastrophic coverage above it. We can do the same thing. Um, and I'm wholly supportive of, of, of my HSA. So this is not a competition between them. They do some amazing things that we're not doing. And, and we learn from each other and share stuff all the time. Um, but I, I think that um, I did it again. The life insurance. So carving out life. Oh, yeah. So I, I do have groups that have uh, just catastrophic um, coverage and, and health spending account. I have lots that don't have disability insurance. I have maybe one that has no life insurance. I'm still, I think the most important benefit is LTD. And uh, so I always kind of insist on that. And most people are not great at buying life insurance. And I, I, I don't think you have to go and have three times earnings or half a million through group. I think that's kind of wasteful. But I, you know, if you can cover burial costs, that's good. And for the most part, even the smallest groups can get 50000 even $100,000 of life insurance coverage at a fair price. Not the cheapest, but, but not bad and blended and you know, smoker, non-smoker, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, like if I knew everybody had life insurance, if I knew everybody was sitting down with an agent doing needs oh. analysis, getting the term insurance they need, you know, I'd be fine, like carve out group in all cases. But yeah. you're right, that's not happening. No, and I, I've gone back and forth in my head. Like for many years, I always said, like, take the minimum, you should go buy your own. And then I realized people weren't. And, and I've had some really... Um, pivotal learning experiences where like I had a, a, a widow speak to me as we handed across the, I think it was $50,000 life insurance check. And it was a flat 50. And her husband was a, an engineer who had passed away from cancer. And she said, thank you very much. And she was crying. And she said, um, where's the rest come from? And I said, the, the rest of what? And she said, well, like, where's the rest of the insurance money? And I said, well, this is just a group insurance, but I can help you if you have individual life insurance policies you want to try and, you know, find or make claims on, I can try and direct you. And she's like, no, we don't believe in insurance, but where's the money going to pay for my house? And, and where's like, I, I don't work like, and he was relatively young, like mid forties. And yeah. like, she wasn't over 50 and I'm kind of going, you know, family welfare, you know, like, the, like these are not good options, but, um, but that was kind of a rude awakening for me. Conversely, I feel like if you do too well on group insurance, then nobody feels they need to buy individual insurance. So I kind of get stuck going back and forth between those two things. So um, uh, life insurance, I don't think has ever been cheaper, uh, probably easier to access and uh, with, you know, better um, uh, whatever classes for preferred health and things like that. So there isn't really a, a reason not to be buying life insurance. No, there's almost like even now with diabetics can get term insurance in a lot of yeah. cases. Like there's HIV the positive, you can get it now. Yeah. 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 Smoking status has uh, you know relaxed a little bit in some cases. Like yeah. yeah, that's and I mean yeah. that's always insurable anyways. It's just cost. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I I almost think, like the group insurance should come with a warning that says, hey, like you're getting this life insurance, but it is not enough. It is absolutely 100% not enough. Yeah, I think it's one area that we fail in in educating people, uh, whether that is in uh, the, you know, investments and, and insurance and mortgages and stuff like that. Like it's, we, we don't teach that stuff in school. And I was just speaking to a business owner who's 23 years old yesterday, and he's asking about group benefits and and I'm, they're just starting up. They, so he's only, he's not even an employee officially and he has a subcontractor. And so it's gonna be a little while till they kind of form up properly. Uh, but um, he said, well, do you think, you know, somebody at 23 year olds needs life insurance? And, and I said, well, you know, you're single and yeah, you don't have any real debt or anything. No, then the need isn't huge, but it's never been cheaper and you're never gonna be healthier than you are today. 
So go out today and buy a million dollars life insurance and pay your 20 bucks a month or something. And, uh, and you'll have it. And so next time you do a business, you know, improvement loan and the bank says, Hey, we want that secured that quarter million dollars. Then you can say, no problem. I'll just assign my life insurance to you and, and away you go. And uh, so I, yeah, I, I think there needs to be bigger discussions around that with people when they're younger and we don't, we don't do well talking about life and death and taxes and stuff like that. So uh, going back to LTD, um, yep. and I've seen you make the argument, and I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but I've seen you make the argument yep. lately that you know some groups could have a instead of sixty six percent or whatever two thirds LTD, you could do a fifty percent income replacement on an LTD plan. Yeah, um, I think I don't know if I've said that exactly. I, I don't know <laughs> if you said you should, but you yeah. could. I, I, I'm not I think, suggesting you're yeah. recommending it. Yeah, I yeah. think we're down. Well, it, and you could put in a maximum on the LTD benefit, so you could say. We're just going to give coverage up to the NEM, the non-evidence maximum. So in a small group, maybe that's 2,000 or 2,500. So instead of doing two-thirds to 10,000 and you have to medically qualify, we'll just kind of cap it off at 2,500. And you can go buy individual coverage to top it up. Um, I think we're going to see a, a catastrophic shift in long-term disability coverage in the next five to 10 years. I think um, we're going to see it probably disappear. I think it's probably going to be challenged on a human rights uh, side of things because the benefit ends at age 65 and we have lots of people working past 65 that then don't get that benefit. And I think if that happens, then it's going to switch into a sickness benefit rather than a disability benefit. And the difference would be more defined length of time. It might be a two-year benefit or a five-year benefit. So, you know, a lot more cost effective, but more importantly, the insurance companies don't have to have reserves. If it's not a disability benefit, there's no reserve requirement by law. So um, I think we're going to see an evolution to that. And we've seen already some hybrid programs around disability. So um, I, although I think it's most important, I still try and get in every plan. I'm cognizant of the fact that we may see it disappear or morph in the coming years. And seeing uh, maximums being reduced or lower percentage amounts is, is both are a possibility for sure. That's an interesting bit of prognostication. And I, I mean, I think COVID will contribute to that to some extent. I think we haven't seen long haul yeah. really how that's going to affect yet. I, I know that rates have gone up during COVID like on disability. So yeah, we, yeah we've seen some staggering adjustments uh, and it, it's not just COVID, right? It's, yeah. it's a compilation of low interest rates up until, or up until maybe this year um, have meant the reserve requirement adjustments are huge. So insurance companies are every year just having to throw millions and millions and millions of dollars in to fund the reserves for claims that happened 20 years ago, 15, 10, five last year. And the only place to get that is from today's clients. So, you know, looking forward, if you have today's clients shrinking and shrinking and reserve requirements growing somewhere along the line, we're going to price ourselves out of the market. And uh, so that those, those are the things I kind of worry about, but time will tell. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. You know, I'd be interested to see how this does play out because I, I agree with you that sort of LTD, like two thirds income replacement till age 65 for a bunch of reasons probably doesn't continue to be viable or the pricing yeah. pressures will push it out of the market. Yeah, and I, I think fundamentally, and I mean, I don't know, this doesn't really play a major role, but just thinking theoretically, in the past, you went to work for a company for 30 years and they took care of you and you took care of them and everything else. We have people bouncing around all over the place forever, but you're kind of having these, the, these benefits are lifelong. Um, is that right or wrong? You know, like we've talked about maybe high cost drugs like gene therapies that are millions of dollars should be treated more like disability coverage. And, you know, does it, does it carry on? Does it carry forward? Do you pre-fund it? Like, how does it all work when you've got $2 million dollar gene therapies and, and things like that. I, we're we're going to have some challenges in the, in the next, you know, five to 10 years and prognosticating. I mean, I always kind of throw my stuff out there and say, this is where I think we're going to be. This is the decade for TPAs. You know, we're going to see a, a full disclosure and compensation. You know, I've made a few and uh, every now and then I'll get in a seminar and somebody will stand up and uh, I, I think it might've been Chris Price at one. He goes, Dave, I was here five years ago and you said within five years, this would happen. And I you know, said, you know, Chris, 
I, I know I said that and I still stand by that within five years, you know, like, <laughs> did I say what five years, you know, but I, and I'm shocked by the lack of um, change, quite frankly, uh, like we, we're doing the same thing we've done for years and years and years, like the, the chip plan is a little bit different. The guys at my HSA kind of taking HSAs to a whole new place is, is a little bit different, but I mean, traditional plans haven't changed hardly at all. So I, I think, you know, we're, we're overdue for, for some change. That's interesting. Um, any last minute comments here about uh, CGIB chip or about, uh, about Dave himself here? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know what else. Um, if, if you're in the benefit space, I mean, if I can do a little bit of a plug, yeah. um, check out CGIB, uh, CGIB.ca, Canadian Group Insurance Brokers. Uh, if you're you know, trying to up your game, if you're looking for tools and resources and, and help, I, we started out this way, but I, I think things like the Slack channel where you can put up a question and have it answered from people across Canada is, is unique. And I mean, or, well, you've got yours with, with your group, but, um, but I, it doesn't, it, it, uh, you don't have to be alone. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of people to help support. Um, so that's one. And if you want to know more about the chip program, you can reach out to, to me or to your bene uh, BBD benefits by design account rep and, and they're all staffed up. There's some general information on the CGIB website. Uh, if you're a CGIB member, you can go into the members only site. There's calculators where you can put in the numbers and get the pricing um, like instantly for the, the, uh, the chip plan and health spending account. So you can do a quote in front of a client just to give them a budget if you want. So uh, lots of things like that. And uh, me, yeah, I mean, same old, same old, nothing's new in Dave's life other than no sailing trips for a little while, I guess. So this whole uh, COVID issue, eh? So. Yeah, May, May is the next one. We're just hoping we can make that one. So oh, perfect. Well, yeah. keep us posted. Yeah. So cool. Thank you very much for having me. This has been Thanks great. Thanks so much, Dave. You're a fantastic guest as always. And I mean, the education cool. orientation you have, I think uh, really shines through. So thank you. And, and likewise, I mean, what you give back and, and I just, I'll do one reverse plug here for you. Um, I have never done online CE webinars because I think you guys do it so well. So we've been asked by CGIB to do this forever, but Business Career College, what you've built, the content that you have, affordable, accessible, you know, in multi-formats from podcasts to traditional um, seminars and recorded webinars and things like that are uh, fantastic. So hats off to you for continuing to uh, share knowledge and make people better. Thanks so much, Dave. Have a wonderful day. You too. All right, um, lots there. Um, you can see Dave really knows his group benefit stuff well, gets into some, into some history there, um, which uh, I know some folks out there will be a fan of. I am, I like to know that background. It's good to uh, run into that kind of thing. And the uh, number for today is four. The number is four. There we go, let's try that again. Number is four. All right, uh, please join me again in uh, two weeks time. We're gonna do a little more insurance stuff. We're gonna talk to Amanda about uh, leveraging within insurance contracts. Enjoy your continued studies. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits and you'll have access to our full library of content.